Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, today. Good morning. Um, I would like to welcome you all on uh, behalf of Club Remedit and Aurat Foundation uh, to this uh, virtual policy discussion on inclusive implementation of National Adaptation Plan on Climate Resilience 2023 in Pakistan. Uh, this initiative is uh, being done under the Share Society uh, initiative, Share Society Phase 4, uh, which is being implemented uh, in the partnership with Orth Foundation in Pakistan, and uh, it is supported by Ellen B. Slifka Foundation uh, to, uh, to support this initiative. I would like to welcome you all uh, to this uh, important discussion. Uh, this uh, discussion is a continuity of uh, uh, the past uh, policy discussions on uh, this subject, uh, where we consulted with the community leaders and civil society over 70 uh, community leaders and civil CSO experts joined us last month to uh, provide their with their suggestion recommendation. Uh, today, we are going to be joined by an uh, esteemed uh, panelist, a group of panelists, uh, who will be going to share with us uh, the global perspectives and the national perspectives. Uh, a couple of logistic announcements before I request uh, Mr. Naim Mirza to start uh, and uh, give his welcome remarks. Uh, one is uh, that uh, due to Iranian president visit to Pakistan, we are facing a lot of uh, internet uh, connection issues um, at various cities, including Karachi and Lahore and Islamabad. Uh, so uh, bear with uh, it uh, as some of our panelists and participants might face uh, this uh, uh, difficulty can put their comments and recommendations and questions in the chat box, which uh, we will be going to ask uh, from the panelists. Um, to begin with the, today's session, uh, I would like to request uh, Mr. Naim Mirza Saab, who is uh, the uh, executive director of Orth Foundation uh, Pakistan. Uh, Naim Saab, uh, you know that uh, we have uh, these uh, policies and plans, and uh, Orth Foundation and many other civil society organizations are. Uh, uh, working and advocating and lobbying for these plans. Uh, and now when we have uh, the policy and plans, uh, those policies and plans, what we see is not implemented. So how do you view what what is the way forward, how we can uh, like uh, uh, turn from this uh, policy thing to into actions when we'll be going to uh, uh, be able to do that. Um, in the meanwhile, I would, uh, I, I can see that uh, our uh, Club Limited member and uh, former Prime Minister of Canada, Ms. Kim Campbell, has also joined us. So warm welcome to you, Ms. Kim Campbell, for joining us. Uh, we have uh, been just in the start, of, and I would like to request uh, Naim Mirza Saab to uh, give his welcome remarks and uh, his insights and thoughts on this subject. Uh, Naim Mirza Saab, floor is yours. Thank you, Ali, uh, for uh, holding this uh, important discussion on a very, very critical issue faced by the global community <clears throat> and its people on this uh, beautiful earth, which if we do not do, not do anything, would, would not remain as beautiful as it, it, it is. Uh, I welcome all the guests so far who have been able to join, as you said, because of some internet problems here. Uh, truly, we have been facing since uh, yesterday and uh, this will continue, you know, in Lahore and Karachi today, where the Iranian president is visiting. Uh, so I hope that uh, the the honorable panelists uh, will be trying to join, and uh, I hope that they will join, you know, at some point of time. Uh, I welcome, on behalf of uh, Club de Madrid and Orak Foundation. Uh, Honorable Your Excellency Prime Minister of Canada, Ms. Kim, Kim Campbell, uh, who is a member of the club de Madrid, and we have uh, also listened previously uh, on various issues. Uh, she has uh, continuously been uh, you know, enlightening us. We also have Dr. Rana Malik with us. She is the head of the Gender Studies Department in Punjab University. I think I am right about the portfolio. And the uh, rest of the speakers have not joined so far, uh, but you know we can begin the discussion. Uh, Ali, I think this is uh, this is uh, the way it is unfolding, and with the 
uh, with the last uh, you know uh, conference we have uh, the momentum uh, has started being developing you know it is it is being uh, shaped so the alarm bell was you know the rang sometimes uh, two three years ago in pakistan when the floods hit our uh, vast areas and we have seen uh, vast uh, you know massive destruction of uh, livelihood uh, also human casualties and very huge loss of infrastructure uh the way the global community responded to uh, this uh, human disaster natural disaster which was turned into human uh, calamity was uh, was very encouraging the secretary general of the united nations visited pakistan many other uh, uh, you know uh, uh, people came here and expressed solidarity and uh, with that they uh, realized that how dangerous it is becoming the way uh, the glaciers are melting way the way the oceans are being you know they are shrinking the way the global uh, the way the global warming is increasing and increasing to uh, you know uh, with a dangerous uh, proportion uh, the uh, global community uh, came to a consensus and then uh, agreed to a certain benchmark that they won't be they won't let the global temperature rise to a certain level which uh, you know they must stop otherwise we'll have a very very uh, dire consequences on this planet uh i think the response is uh, different at different uh, levels and there has been some best practices because i heard that in portugal uh the government response was very encouraging and the citizen response was very encouraging and portugal has is, is near you know almost close to converting its uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, sources of energy to renewable energy resources this is a this is a huge achie achievement by this country if i'm right i don't know and this is what i have read uh the in a similar uh, way please also tell me when i need to stop because uh, you know uh, i have no uh, idea about uh, the uh, the fresh agenda after the absence of a uh, few panels so uh, in pakistan uh, after the change of government after the new, new elections uh, unfortunately uh, the momentum has uh, gone down you know uh, frankly speaking uh, with the previous uh, stand alone ministry ministry of climate change uh, is you know is no more uh, as a stand alone ministry um, and might have been summed in uh, you know in, in, you know merged with some other uh, portfolio the uh, and the kind of vigor which we which we saw you know last year and before that with shri rehman saba taking the charge and going for uh, policy measures also practical practical measures uh, bringing a national plan of action and you know moving the uh, the national effort against uh, climate uh, global warming and climate change uh, we were very happy and we felt very encouraged that uh, things are moving in the right direction uh but that is not the case at present we we that's why our foundation and you know in collaboration with club de madrid thought that we uh, meet once again and uh, try to uh, bring in more people there have been uh, also but at the same time there have been good developments as uh, we spoke to the decision makers and the policy makers that Uh, you know you need to talk to them and you need to uh, reinvigorate the same spirit which we had previously made them understand though they understand but made them realize that we need to take uh, practical steps in the meantime uh, ali imran sahab you have conducted a community leaders uh, community uh, you know leaders meeting and citizens meeting uh, on the uh, responses of uh, 
climate change and they have given very good suggestions which which we have seen i think all these uh, contribute to the national effort uh, and also the provincial effort and maybe at the grassroots level uh, a consolidated consolidated uh, response to uh, bring in uh, the same will and determination and also practical measures uh, one such measure uh, we saw that it, the uh, announcement by the uh, one of the uh, provincial government uh, that is punjab uh, which, uh, which they said that they are going to give uh, you know solar panels to uh, consumers you know poor consumers uh, which who will use uh, 100 units of uh, uh, you know uh, electricity power so these are the measures which uh, which encourage us which uh, uh bring uh, the challenges we are facing to four and i hope that uh, already equipped with the policy already equipped with the national disaster uh, plan and national climate change plan uh, in our uh, you know uh, in our position uh, we are aware of the challenges we are aware of the uh, responses the communities and the citizens uh, responses are there the intelligentsia the academia is uh, is is moving in the right direction uh, several uh, public sector universities are opening uh, you know uh, climate uh, change uh, uh, climate justice uh, uh, departments uh, at their campuses this is a very good uh, uh, you know uh, an encouraging uh, initiative uh i think uh, a very essential uh, step should be taken not only by pakistan but by all governments and you know at different levels of uh, uh, tiers of education is that to include the fundamental uh, policies fundamental issues and uh, responses including policies and uh, practical measures about climate uh, justice in their curriculum as if we as soon as possible if we do that that will uh, this will bring uh, the 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 issue of saving the earth uh, saving the earth uh, from a complete disaster you know which if uh, we do not do anything it will uh, it will be there uh, it will be there it will hit us uh, say you know gradually it has already hitting us one uh, poet even fi fun, fine poet you know my friend uh, i met him uh, you know a few days back he, he had a very fine sense of uh, aesthetics and he told me he was also very interested in flowers and in birds and in colors he told me that uh, when he uh, examined uh, the colors of a butterfly he was astonished to see that they are losing their colors and he found me he was he felt so disturbed that they the, the colors are not as uh, sharp and not as diverse as they used to be uh, a, a man of middle ages he might have seen you know bright and beautiful colors of a butterfly so butterflies and the fishes and the plants and the flowers are losing started losing colors what will remain that if this earth loses its color loses its, its energy loses its climate eh? and this human species which has you know uh, the distinction of being the uh, you know uh, having consciousness will disappear uh, you know so this is a very sad you know it happens so i end uh, with these remarks and uh, and moving you know and hoping for a fruitful discussion thank you uh, ali uh thank you name sahab uh, for uh, sharing your thoughts and uh, you have absolutely been right that uh, uh, the policy frameworks and legal frameworks might uh, be present there but unless until unless uh, those are not implemented uh, and uh, steps are not taken and you have mentioned about some of the uh, aspects uh, which are being implemented and that's uh, one reason why we are having today's uh, uh, policy discussion and in today's policy discussion uh we'll be going to hear from uh, the policy makers uh, and uh, the one who are implementing these policies so in today's uh, session we have uh, invited uh, mr anthony navid sahotra who is a 
uh, from Christian uh, community and he's uh, the deputy speaker of Provincial Assembly of Sindh. Uh, he, is, uh, he will join us uh, shortly. Uh, we are going to have uh, Mr. Ramesh Singh Aroda, who is the Minister for Minorities Affair, uh, Government of Punjab, who himself uh, belongs to Sikh faith and is a community leader. Uh, will be uh, joined uh, by Peter and the Federal Minister for Human Rights. Uh, she is one of the staunch voices of uh, religious minorities and ethnic minorities in Pakistan. So we are going to listen to her. Um, so in the meanwhile, we have been joined by Ms. Maria Arena, Secretary General of uh, Club United as well. Um, I shall encourage audience uh, to keep uh, posting their uh, uh, questions and comments in the chat box. Um, so I'll uh, move uh, to um, uh, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Uh, Kim Campbell, who is uh, the member of Club de Madrid and uh, former Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, she has uh, decades uh, long uh, political career and have been uh, in uh, key ministries in the past, Minister of Justice, National Defense and Veteran Affairs. Uh, he, she has been uh, the leader of Progressive Conservative and uh, she teaches at Harvard. And she is the first woman Prime Minister of Canada, so we can proudly uh, say that. Uh, so, Her Excellency uh, King Campbell, thank you very much for joining. And uh, you have just uh, listened to the thoughts of uh, Mr. Naim Mirza. Um, we last uh, month, we had uh, a consultation with over 70 uh, community leaders and civil society experts uh, to give their suggestions and recommendation to implement uh, the National Adaptation Plan uh, uh, which was uh, developed by the government of Pakistan last year in July. Uh, this plan has some short-term and uh, some long, medium-term and long-term objectives and plans. Uh, but since nine months have been passed and much has not been progressed, so I would like to ask that uh, since uh, uh, you have uh, your global uh, perspectives as well, uh, so many of the countries around the world, they are developing their national adaptation plans. But some of the countries, especially the countries in the South, um, which are debt stressed and have very little to um, support uh, these kind of plans. For instance, if I mention about Pakistan, um, the Pakistani budget in 2023-24 only puts 0.03% of its uh, national budget uh, to the climate change issues. So with this minor less than 0.05% uh, uh, budget going to uh, Uh, the climate change, how supported that uh, this uh, kind of uh, beautifully written national adaptation plan. And I feel proud in saying that uh, this is one of the national adaptation plan, which has a subsection on uh, the vulnerable groups and how to uh, uplift uh, those vulnerable groups. So what are your thoughts on that? How uh, uh, such a beautifully uh, written national adaptation plan can translate it into actions? Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Excellency uh, Kim Campbell. You're, you're muted, so your mic can be open. Hi, how do I okay. do this? Uh, uh, you, you are again muted, uh, so you have to unmute yourself. Hang on, hang on. I, I, I think I'm unmuted by me. Can you hear me? Yeah, can, we can hear you oh. now. Please. And I'm sorry, I was moving around because I could see on my little screen, I'm having problems with my screen. I can't turn it around and I, my nameplate seemed to be hiding me. So I kept putting bigger cushions underneath me so that I could look out over my nameplate. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. And uh, Mr. Mirza's remarks were uh, wonderful, but also very worrisome. When we look at the impacts of climate change, small things like the effect on a, a species that we love and that is, is a source of great joy to us as human beings, the idea of reduction of carbon makes us realize how complex are the influences of our changing climate. Um, and so I'm delighted to be here to, to just add a couple of remarks to this discussion on uh, your national adapt adaptation plan on climate resilience, because it is you are really on the cutting edge uh, and uh, very imaginative. I speak to you as a member of the Club of Madrid, which as you know, is, is uh, an organization of over a hundred uh, former heads of state and government of democratic countries. And so our main concern, what we're, we're, we are concerned about is how the democratic process, how democratic institutions can help us achieve our goals. And the challenge of climate change is that 
it can, in fact, put a great deal of strain on democratic institutions as people are feeling frustrated and worried and in despair. And I, innocently, I, I have a certain um, set mixed feelings about speaking to you about this since I, I'm speaking to you from Italy, but I'm a Canadian and I come from a country which is one of the biggest emitters. Um, on the other hand, uh, because we have a strong democracy and strong democratic uh, institutions and inclusive institutions, uh, and to the, to the effect that climate change has affected us, particularly through wildfires uh, uh, and flooding, but wildfires have been particularly bad, um, our democratic institutions have worked reasonably well in helping us to address these issues. So I think what, what our... Um, our interest in is is to encourage and to offer our support in bringing together ideas and best practices of how Pakistan can use its democratic can can, can use its institutions to help solve the problems, but also avoid having the 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 social disruption that climate change creates undermine those democratic institutions because people will always be looking for uh, for excuses and incidentally. One of the things that I, you know, I, you, you, in my your introduction, you mentioned that I had been Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. I'm a lawyer, and it's one thing that I'm sure I share with many of the people in your government. There's a lot of lawyers go into government, and the rule of law is has become a very important part of our struggle against climate change because what we're finding more and more, people being able to use the courts to hold emitters accountable. And so what I want to say is that what's so important when we're creating action plans and things is to keep people committed to the reality of climate change. I saw an interview the other day where the former pre prime minister of Australia, Anthony Abbott, was actually sitting on a panel and saying that he doubted the science of climate change. I just about tore my hair out watching this because there are a lot of people uh, often with big economic interests, the representatives of oil companies and others, who refuse to acknowledge the reality. And what that does, that makes it very hard for democratic decision makers, for makers, policymakers, to do the things they want to do, because it undermines the constituency for good policy. Because if people say, well, maybe I don't really need to do that. Maybe I don't need to change this. Maybe I don't need to... Uh, be concerned about something because, you know, after all, maybe it's not as big a problem as people say. Now, the good news about the disasters in places like Pakistan is it certainly makes it very clear that this is not some kind of hoax or some kind of plot. But the bad news is, is that the human suffering that that goes into demonstrating this is very great. And the worst news is that even in light of that, there are people who are pushing back, who don't want to spend the resources, who don't want to change their own economic well-being. I don't know what they tell their grandchildren. I don't know if they think there is some great gated community in the sky that will protect them from the impacts of climate change. But it is very difficult. So the challenge that democracies face is how to, first of all, have the constituencies, how to create what are often powerful economic interests, how to reduce their ability to undermine the, the ability of democratic bodies to make decisions. And secondly, as we've talked about, and one of the Club of Madrid's concerns is, how you keep these issues from dividing societies. You know, we created our shared societies program because 90% of the countries of the world have, have minorities of at least 10%. And Canada is a great example of that. We have two official languages. We have a large indigenous community. And interestingly, our indigenous community and their interests have become even more important as we deal with climate change. First of all, because many of their lands are affected, but also because they have in the past had ways of dealing with uh, things like preventing wildfires by doing controlled burns in forests. And for a long time, people sort of poo-pooed that and said, well, what do they know? Well, actually, they knew a great deal because they've been living there for thousands of years and they understood. I mean, wildfires can come from a lot of reasons, but we're more vulnerable uh, with climate change and drying. So it is very important to try and make sure that we don't allow the social stresses that climate change pre presents and the social the, the stresses that it puts on people who are trying to make good policy and good decisions to further divide our societies. So I think that's one of the things that, that, that the Club of Madrid is very concerned about is to try and help create or, or, or by sharing 
best practices? How do we can create resilient societies that will help uh, deal with this, this global issue without leaving people behind, without increasing and exacerbating the divisions that exist naturally in very diverse societies. And you said somebody's going to be speaking from the Christian community. You know, I mean, Pakistan is another, you know, uh, society that has many different communities. And it's so important that they can come together and that the democracies can function. The other thing is that often when we don't include people, we really exclude a lot of expertise. You know, again, in Canada, for a long time, we were, you know, very dismissive often of the wisdom of our indigenous communities because they had a different style of life that they wanted. They wanted to remain often in their, their communities. They wanted to still engage in ways of life that were very close to the land, although they're highly intelligent people and they can, you know, they can be doctors and lawyers like anybody else, but they have a certain spiritual connection to land that they want to maintain and we poo-pooed it. Well, now we understand that there's an enormous amount of wisdom there. And I think that if we don't tap into the wisdom and the insights that all of our people have, and interestingly enough, often people who live in poverty have uh, a lot of res resourcefulness and the ability often to implement changes that are not, um, you know, highly capital intensive, but that can often be very useful in helping us to manage because so much of managing climate change is, is at the, 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 what we call the granular level, the sort of the grassroots level. Um, I sit on a global commission for climate overshoot and we presented our report in September of 2023. It's chaired by Pascal Lamy, who you may have known was a former director general of the World Trade Organization. And we had a meeting in Jakarta where some of our members went out and actually <laughs> got down to their, their underwear and went into the water to plant mangroves in a mangrove <laughs> swamp. You could imagine. Um, I did not participate in that activity, but it was, <laughs> it was quite interesting because, again, mangroves and mangrove uh, forests are very valuable in managing the flooding at a coastal level. Now, a lot of people sitting in an office, you know, might not understand that, but people who live in those areas and are involved in maintaining those, those mango forests really understand. So what I'm saying is we have to see our citizens uh, at all different levels. I mean, Pakistan, you have a lot of very smart, educated people and scientists in the professions, et cetera. But you also have a lot of people whose knowledge and wisdom comes from generations of learning to deal with certain areas and their ability to see. I mean, the, the person who who told Mr. Mirza about the butterflies that was was a was a butterfly expert. But there are ways in which people who are close to the land and close to smaller communities can be very important eyes and ears to identify issues that may be emerging. So I guess what I would say from my perspective, uh, you know, I'm representing members of the Club of Madrid. Things that we can do to help and to support a focusing on making democratic institutions work well, to avoid discrimination and marginalization, understanding that climate change creates stresses on democratic institutions, and the, the goal of, of, of leaving no one behind as we tackle this issue. It's very important, and I commend you, uh, you know, your, your group, on identifying that. So I would simply say that, that what you're experiencing is perhaps... Um, on a scale greater than many other countries because you've been disproportionately affected uh, by climate change at this stage, but no, no country will remain unaffected. And, you know, there were people in my country who used to say, oh, well, climate change, you know, we'll grow oranges in Saskatchewan, you know, it'll just get warmer here. Well, maybe, but it will also attack our boreal forests with terrible wildfires. I'm from Vancouver which is a beautiful temperate city on the Pacific Ocean, you know, not too cold in the winter, not too hot in the summer, but it had a heat dome uh, of, of heat that just sat above it on the Pacific Northwest two years ago. It killed 600 people just from that extreme heat. And people said, what's happening here? People who never had to have air conditioners. So no part of the world is, is exempt. And the practices that you can develop and affect uh, put into place in Pakistan will be will be things that could be shared in other parts of the world. So we not only look forward to encouraging and being supportive, but also in learning from your experiences that that can be part of our 
toolkit of best practices because it will be very important uh, for the rest of the world. So democratic institutions are the key to mobilizing people, but they must be protected because they're vulnerable when people are frightened or afraid and looking for someone to blame. Um, we need more than ever to make sure that they are embracing and inclusive. So I'll end my comments there and just say that the Club of Madrid is, is very, very um, uh, a, a full of admiration for what your governments and, and foundations are doing in Pakistan and uh, hoping that we can be a constructive part uh, as you deal with these very difficult issues. And, and I am sorry for Canada's admissions. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much for your comments. And you have rightly said uh, what is uh, whatever uh, with regards to climate is happening at any place will not stay there and uh, will uh, go beyond it and uh, will go everywhere. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, since you have talked about one important aspect of uh, how the rule of law and uh, how the legal rights uh, come into force, uh, that reminds me of uh, Earth Foundation's late uh, um, uh, one of uh, the executive directors, Shaila Zia, uh, she filed a, a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court of Pakistan in 1994, uh, which was with regards to citizens' right to life and uh, how the environment is impacting on the right to life. So that led to the redefinition of right to life in Pakistan's uh, constitution and Pakistan's context. So that's a uh, and uh, through shared society initiative in Pakistan. Since last year, we have we are trying to. Uh, include the voices of vulnerable communities, the religious and ethnic minorities in the policy and plan for formulation. So last year we had intensive uh, virtual dialogues uh, with the Ministry of Climate Change where we invited uh, the leader from uh, the religious and ethnic communities to come forward to put their suggestions into the national adaptation plan. And since this adaptation plan has now been approved by the cabinet last year, uh, the three core area which uh, were identified uh, through this plan was uh, one objective was to support vulnerable groups in strengthening their capacities for disaster risk reduction. So that's uh, one uh, objective. The second objective was to empower vulnerable groups through fostering climate resilient livelihoods. And the third one, which is uh, again very important, is to promote inclusive participation of vulnerable groups in climate related policies and decision making bodies. So now it's uh, the turn of uh, the Pakistani citizens uh, to make uh, the government accountable for uh, the policy and plans which they have approved. And through this uh, discussion and dialogue, we are collecting uh, the suggestion and recommendation from various uh, uh, community leaders and society organizations, and we are lobbying it. Uh, uh, our partner Earth Foundation is leading on that, and we are lobbying it. Uh, so thank you very much for your comments on that. Uh, I would just like to say that a couple of uh, panelists, uh, since uh, the high-level delegation is in the town, so. Uh, they are uh, engaged over there and facing some technical issues as well in terms of assessing internet. So as soon as uh, they join, uh, we'll invite her to uh, them to uh, share their uh, thoughts and perspectives. Um, in the meanwhile, I would like to ask uh, um, uh, one of our uh, panelists for today, uh, Senator Roshan Khushid Barocha, who herself is uh, from Parsi community and one of the leading voices uh, from Balochistan uh, and one of the leading voices who have been uh, supporting Earth Foundation and Club Limited throughout this process. Um, she is a former senator, former minister uh, for human rights. Um, she was very eager to join us today in person, but uh, she is in the USA and due to time zone difference, uh, it's very early morning over there. So she could not join uh, um, uh, to uh, in person, but um, she has sent her uh, video message. So I would like to request uh, uh, the logistic team to if they can uh, uh, play the video message of uh, uh, Senator Roshan Khushid Barocha. is really close to my heart policy assalamualaikum everyone assalamualaikum ali thankful to you for giving me this chance to speak as a guest a speaker on this important topic
My logistic team, the video is stuck. My logistic team, uh, I think uh, there is a problem in uh, uh, displaying the video. Uh, so for now, you can put it off and uh, we can run it uh, after the next panelist. Uh, I think uh, we find uh, some technical issue in uh, playing uh, the video of uh, Senator Roshan Prashid Parocha. Um, I think technical team will work on it and uh, we will be shortly going to listen to her thoughts on that. And she is the one uh, who has been leading this process uh, together with our foundation club in Madrid in Pakistan. So uh, we'll listen to her thoughts shortly. Assalamualaikum everyone. Assalamu alaikum, Ali. Thankful to you for giving me this chance to speak as a guest a speaker on this important topic, which is really close to my heart. Policy discussion on inclusive implementation of National Adaptation Plan on Climate Resilience 2023. I know okay, the World Leadership Alliance Club D Madrid, uh, their group always works as an independent and it is one of the largest group of uh, ex-politician who are no more in the public office and they, uh, uh, they would like to discuss on the, this important uh, um, topic of climate change, which is playing a very important role. As you know that uh, Pakistan, Pakistan is among the countries uh, most vulnerable to the risk associated with climate change and it ranks eighth. Uh, though we know that uh, although its contribution is 1% of global uh, carbon emission, but it, where it is in, but where it's subject to severe national disaster. So what we do is we have to learn a lesson from past, where we went wrong, what happened, how can we go forward, how can we improve ourselves. We always say prevention is better than cure. In the same way, I would tell here also, okay, let's think over it. Let's see, okay, where did we go? Let's see the mindset of the people. What did they suffer? How did they manage to come out of it? And where our mistakes were? We have to look at our mistakes because it was always said, from mistakes we learn. Nobody's perfect, from mistakes we learn. When we make policies, of course, I do agree, there are policies. We are making policies, but are we implementing on that? No, we have to implement what we make. So making policy is not that difficult. Making rules regulation is not that difficult. What is difficult is implementation. And if we implement thing, nothing can go wrong. Everything is possible in this world. I would not say okay, we cannot do anything. We can do. With a small means even, we can do a lot. I've seen myself in flood. When Pakistani people, they all united, they come forward. They have a heart of gold. It's a disaster, we are all one. We forget who we are. We are all human beings and that's what we think in that way. And we run forward to help. So what, personally, I would tell you two, three things. 
data collection important after disaster how are we going to go forward very important to take people vulnerable people on board very very important to have gender on board women on board very important when we make water boards we should have people from that area give what what are they thinking at the same time when we are talking of farmers whose fields are destroyed children don't have anything they they don't have even food to eat because all their fields and everything is destroyed how are we going to help them out what about their livestock yeah, all livestock finished and baluchistan actually let me tell you baluchistan lives on agriculture and livestock only so we have to look at that Okay, how are we going to cover all this up with dignity? Those people living in the red, they also have dignity. So let's do. I feel. Okay, let's get together and work out on that, so that in future, whenever such a disaster, I would always pray. I hope we don't get out this, but anyhow. as we see in the whole world there is a climate change everywhere we have to look into it at the same time what we have been doing instead of going forward we are cutting down woods we are burning woods trees have been destroyed so we have to look at every each and every corner where it's not only like i told you in the beginning it's not only food what we are talking about here we are talking of food health farmers we are talking of livestock we are talking mm, of water we are talking of everything we have to look at as a package how are we going to forward to look into all these areas and so thank you very much these are my one of mm, few recommendation what i would uh, what i put forward and i hope it will be looked into and uh, we are very positive let's pray to god that we don't come across such disasters anymore but that's part of life but whenever disasters come let's be positive let's move about let's start working let's plan out things let's plan out things in a proper way that uh, would be implemented like i told you laws are made rules are made everything is made nothing is implemented like the time being when disaster comes we all start running so like if there is a fire we run for water if there's no fire we don't run for water so let's not do that let's plan out things beforehand uh, and see how we can move about and inshallah i pray to god that whenever there is a will everything has been done so let's work together let's be united let's work for our country let's pray for for the whole world so disasters don't come in and let's have let's prevent all these things and let's be together let's build the capacity of people let's give awareness to the people that when such things come how are they going to move forward building up the capacity is very important giving awareness to those people is very important so let's look into all that thank you very much stay blessed and we'll be listening to other speakers and let's see what they have to say about it and then we can move forward thank you uh, thank you very much uh, senator roshan kushit roja saheb uh, who has uh, uh, who's uh, always a very optimistic um, about uh, aspects and issues in pakistan and very supportive Uh, to the cause of uh, women to the cause of religious minorities to work with rural communities and i'm also proud to say that uh, she is also a board member of orat foundation our partner in pakistan uh, so she's um, uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, she has uh, talked uh, that uh, despite all these odds and all the, these difficulties uh, we still can do a lot and uh, she has uh, suggested few things but uh, i would like to uh, request our next panelist uh, who is uh, professor dr rana malik saiba who is uh, 
uh, the chairperson of the gender studies department of University of Punjab, one of the largest university in Pakistan. Um, and uh, Dr. Rana Malik uh, is uh, closely working on the gender aspects of uh, uh, climate change, as well as uh, she is closely working uh, not only at the academic level, but uh, daily interacting uh, with the youth of Pakistan. So Dr. Rana Malik Saiba, thank you very much for joining. I would like to ask you, since you are interacting with youth and uh, uh, this national adaptation plan uh, talks about certain vulnerable groups, which include women, uh, persons with disabilities, and other vulnerable groups, including the religious and ethnic minorities. And since you are working uh, in your department to initiate uh, a new course on gender and climate change, as well as you were mentioning, uh, so how do you view uh, that uh, how the communities, especially uh, the vulnerable communities, women are religious? minorities, um, the youth groups, how do you feel that whether they are connected or disconnected with the policy discourse and what can be the ways that uh, through which uh, uh, we can encourage uh, these groups uh, to uh, be connected with these uh, policy discourses and to play uh, and contribute their positive role uh, to this uh, policy discourse. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Dr. Anna Malik. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, it's, it's an honor to be part of uh, this esteemed uh, panel today. And I'm very privileged to uh, be sitting with uh, all the honorable guests. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Miss uh, Excellence, uh, Miss uh, Campbell, for indicating the social uh, justice and inclusiveness. I would like to endorse and build my comment on that. That yes, uh, it's very important to when that when we talk about any policy, and particularly when we're talking about climate change. Uh, we are also considering its impact, its effect on the vulnerable groups and how we can actually uh, include all those uh, groups, which is inclusiveness policy, that we don't leave anyone uh, behind. So uh, it's not just uh, including them, but also listening to them, that what they have to say, because it's, it's them who are uh, suffering. We, at a distance, uh, sitting and... Uh, building up plans, uh, bringing out policies like we have the National Adaptation Plan, uh, which, which is being uh, adopted by the uh, cabinet in 2023. So as the, uh, the I would appreciate the efforts also by the Oral Foundation and this uh, particular um, uh, group that they have uh, uh, talked to the community leaders this is what is needed. This is what has been just uh, mentioned by the excellence Ms. Campbell also, that Pakistan has uh, indigenous knowledge. Pakistan has uh, the roots uh, of the people in back uh, in the civilizations older than the history. So like, yes, we have uh, the solutions to the issues we are facing today. But uh, unfortunately, we have just disconnected from that. We have uh, been uh, uh, looking towards the modern techniques. Yes, this is very important, but we have to uh, see what these people are offering to us. And if we will not combine these together, probably we are not able to get the solution also. So in my uh, humble submission, it is that yes, we are uh, as an academician sitting at an educational institution, I often listen to uh, the youth uh, we are uh, dealing with. They have uh, their own solutions and they are coming from the communities. Like as I'm sitting in Punjab University, this is one of the university where the students coming from all over the Pakistan. It's it's a hub of all the uh, provinces from the Gilgit, Baltistan, Fata, from to the Balochistan, uh, far-flung areas of Balochistan like Mustung and Chaman and uh, far behind. And then we have uh, students from uh, uh, the KPK. And then we have also students from the urban areas. Uh, it's not only that the climate change is hitting, you know, the far flung areas or the floods or the earthquakes or, you know, uh, calamities in the uh, mountains. We, we in the urban uh, population is also uh, uh, similarly being affected by the climate change issues. So we have those issues also uh, being discussed in our classrooms. And recently uh, we have started, uh, recently we have started a, a degree program, which is a four years degree program in gender and climate change, specifically targeting uh, 
definitely the vulnerable group. And we are talking more about the gender equality inclusiveness in the climate change programs and policies. And if you see uh, uh, the National Adaptation Plan, you will see only a chapter on women and the vulnerable groups. But now we are talking more about the, quality, the gender equality in the, in the strategies, in the policies uh, we are looking forward. So the inclusion of these uh, groups is very important. And if we see the statistics also, we will see that who are the most affected ones uh, by these kind of calamities. And, uh, and we will see that these are the women and the children, the vulnerable groups, including the people with disabilities, the older uh, people, the religious minorities. So I personally believe that we should talk more about these groups. Yes, the men, uh, I'm not excluding them, but in general, if we see the figures also, this group, uh, these people are more affected. Women are the least, uh, are the ones who are least talked about in these policies. And these are the ones who are most affected because of the feminization of poverty in these areas, because of uh, their attachment with the children, with the older people. They are the last ones who will be leaving uh, in case of any disaster or any calamity. And then uh, what we uh, generally forget is the most vulnerable groups, which are the transgenders in our society. So we, we don't uh, usually talk about them, what issues they face in case of such calamities. And the older people also, the persons with disabilities, we don't have, yes, when we talk about the policies, we have very visual plans that we will be equipping them with kind of technologies and uh, latest uh, machineries and things. But in reality, we know that this is not uh, being uh, done in the, at the ground level. So they were the ones who are most vulnerable in such uh, um, uh, calamity. So uh, we should be thinking about them. Even if in the, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's unfortunate uh, that uh, we don't have a kind of, sensitization towards uh, the people with disabilities. Even in the very, uh, I would say, even in the universities now, it's been uh, uh, that there is a change in the mindset very recently, I would admit, that we have uh, started this, uh, uh, developing grams for these people and uh, uh, coming up with some kind of technology. It's very recent phenomenon. So yes, we must admit that we are not sensitized. And when we see such uh, things in, in case of uh, calamities or disasters, it's it's uh, almost uh, nothing on the ground we are doing. So yes, uh, there are two, three things which I want to uh, pinpoint. One is the engagement with the youth, which is very important. As you have just mentioned that we have almost 60% above youth population. So this is this is where we can you know, build on our policies and plans. And this is where the role of the academic institutions also come in. Yes, we have uh, children uh, who are out of school. We have youth, which is not coming to the colleges and universities, but a lot of uh, can be done through the people who are coming. Because there is one, if there is one person, I personally believe that if there is one young people coming from one community, one, uh, uh, you can say, a community of about uh, even 100 people, uh, he or she can be a change agent thing. So if we can uh, sensitize that person, if we can uh, work with that person, it, it there will be wonders we can imagine of. So there is a need for uh, a definitely uh, engaging with the youth and also bringing them on board when we are uh, drafting such policies and plans. Because when they will own the policy, they will able to deliver in the uh, field. If they don't own it, I personally believe they will not. Uh, they will this. Uh, uh, they will uh, not align themselves with whatever being uh, said at the provincial or the uh, federal levels. And then uh, uh, inclusiveness of uh, the other vulnerable groups. And I would not uh, like to include women in this because women are not. I, I personally don't think they are vulnerable, but the circumstances make them vulnerable in, in Pakistan, particularly. So there is a need to uh, definitely have women on the boards and the people with disabilities because they are the ones who can uh, inform us, who can share their concerns uh, with the uh, within the policies and uh, how we can address it. And then um, the uh, to have our indigenous knowledge, to have uh, that skills, 
uh, based on the context on the region we are working in because we have uh, uh, knowledge about uh, the, the health issues of the women. We have been dealing with the health, the reproductive health issues of the women from centuries and centuries. But now we have, and there are many of, you know, uh, the indigenous uh, knowledge and uh, the local uh, things which can be done uh, for the reproductive health of women. And we are uh, basing on that also. It's not only that we have, we are not, but there's a need to actually recognize that. Uh, we, we in our policies and plans, we totally forget that. So there is, I think there is a need to uh, to have, to work on this also. In the universities uh, also, there's a need for a research, particularly uh, for uh, have data on this indigenous knowledge so that we can uh, bring for, forward as being uh, just mentioned by the excellence Ms. Campbell, that yes, the world is looking towards Pakistan, that what uh, skills they had, how they were uh, actually countering with these kind of issues in the past. So there's a need for a research, definitely. Uh, we should uh, not forget, you know, the old in this uh, civilization in which we were uh, so good in and we were able to deliver to the world. So listening to these people uh, for the uh, food uh, sustainability, yes, we have been uh, talking about it. We have been talking about the proper waste management. So these are the people who are actually the ones who will be doing so. Uh, I will just uh, quote an example that in Lahore, um, just in two of the uses in Lahore, uh, at our own level, we are working with uh, the communities group. And uh, it's been like uh, two years now. And the results has been wonderful because they are the ones we, we just, uh, uh, we were doing uh, the compost. We are making compost with the uh, uh, kitchen waste there. We are doing the, uh, we are just made them aware about the importance of the kitchen gardening and we provided them with some basic, you know, um, equipment for that, the seeds and the, you know, uh, the grow bags and the, the soil. And the initiative was all there. So it's been like two years that they have been uh, doing the kitchen gardening and now they are uh, uh, self-sufficient in growing their own uh, kitchen vegetables. So this is only a kind of mindset. It's not the resources which are much needed for these kind of awareness programs. It's only the mindset that, yes, you you can do it at your own also. So it's not only that we need a policy for that. It's only the mindset, the, the awareness among the people that, yes, they can uh, also do it at their level. Yes, there are things which the government need to do, but definitely we need to uh, have some kind of uh, awareness among the youth particularly. And uh, here in these two uses, we are, uh, uh, the youth is the center of our activities. So they are the ones who are motivating their uh, parents in their houses. They are the ones who are taking care of their plants. So they are the ones who are actually uh, the motivating force uh, uh, behind all these. And as being uh, mentioned by uh, Mirza Saab in the beginning, that yes, we need to have these things in our curriculum also. It's not only that we do it at the colleges or universities, we need to do it from the very basic primary level. So the kitchen gardening is nothing, I would say it's only the mindset we uh, just have to inculcate among our children that yes, we can do it in the schools also. So, and we have examples from all around the world that how the children are working in uh, this field, how they are going to the fields and how motivated and you know they are uh, in uh, doing activities like these. So we need to uh, think on uh, both on the individuals end. And uh, uh, for the policy, I would say that we need to set a, a kind of implementation mechanism also, because we are uh, going to translate the policy from the federal to the provincial levels. And here in Pakistan, we have climate change and environment more as a provincial subject than a federal. So at the national level, yes, we have policies, but we need to uh, have a proper mechanism also for that, for the implementation. And then at the local level also, you know, from the provincial to the local body. So uh, when we don't have the local bodies uh, at the ground, it's it's difficult to translate it at the grassroots levels. So we need to have a system, uh, you know, for, so that uh, we are clear in our lines, uh, the directions in which we are going. It's just not that we approve a plan and then we, Think that it will the things will be uh, going to be done automatically. So we need to be very realistic uh, that when we are talking about things, 
that how we will translate policies and the plans uh, at the grassroots and take them at the grassroots level. So, and, um, and then I would like to say that we need to work uh, uh, side by side at the urban issues also, you know, the water issues. And particularly when I'm sitting in Lahore, the smog, the pollution we have here, and the people don't want to come to Lahore, even the, our guests, they were, they think twice that if they want to go to Lahore to spend, you know, uh, a month and so. So yes, we, we need to uh, see these issues also. And I think uh, at the individual level, we can do more than at the, looking at the government level. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Anna Malik Sahib. You have highlighted some of the pertinent uh, issues. Um, and as uh, you have mentioned that, uh, uh, in my words, it's uh, like we are the nation of crisis and uh, we are very much uh, crisis resilient. So, of course, we are dealing with all these crises in uh, our recent history. Uh, but you have rightly mentioned that uh, some uh, section of society are more vulnerable than uh, other section of societies. So, um, for instance, you have talked about uh, feminization of poverty. And if we see that uh, the 2022 floods, uh, they hit, uh, worst hit uh, 25 districts out of which 19 were the poorest uh, districts of Pakistan. So the communities living over there uh, does have uh, like that kind of impact. And recently in last 10 days, uh, the rains in Pakistan has uh, caused uh, the lives of 81 people who have died uh, in uh, rain related, rain, uh, related uh, incidents in last 10 days in Pakistan. So it's uh, not something which is uh, stopping here. It's uh, something which is ongoing and continuous. But uh, uh, the take I uh, have from uh, your talk about Prof uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rana Malik Sahiba is that, uh, uh, of course, it's important to have plans and policies in place. But at the same level, it's very important to work with the communities to create awareness and to take small steps at each and every level um, to, to, to mitigate that. Um, that leads me to uh, uh, the question and answer session as well. And uh, I would like to start uh, uh, with a question to Ms. Kim Campbell. Ms. Kim Campbell, one of uh, the aspect of uh, uh, National Adaptation Plan is to empower uh, the vulnerable groups, uh, the communities in decision-making roles. And you have talked about uh, the democratic cultures and democracy, how it can be uh, a support to, to, to that kind of things. Uh, Pakistan does have uh, the quota-based systems uh, to have uh, like 3% religious minorities in the parliament and uh, 20, uh, around 17.5% of the women in the parliament. So uh, around 25% of Pakistan's uh, legislatures, they are from religious minorities are from uh, women. So uh, for instance, in terms of ministries, in terms of adding the executive, adding the bureaucracy, we see uh, like uh, their percentages dropping to like two, three percent, uh, not more than four, five percent. So how do you view that um, uh, we have that kind of political will present in Pakistan to um, empower the local communities uh, in, in some of uh, the decision making goals, uh, but it's not translating into action. So how do you see that how much it is important that uh, uh, such kind of uh, climate resilient plans and national adaptation plans do have not only the voices of the uh, vulnerable groups, but also the decision making. So how important is that? Well, that's a, you know, a really important question. Um, you know, going back to my own experience, where in many cases, I was I was the first woman to be Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. I was the first woman to be Minister of National Defense, aside from having been the first woman Prime Minister. And when people who are not the usual suspects are not the uh, uh, the usual uh, demographic profile. You get into certain jobs. What you find is they often ask different questions. But even though, for example, when I was Minister of Justice and I was dealing with issues, I, I, I hosted a national symposium on women law and the administration of justice. But I never assumed that being a woman, I could answer all of the questions or that I could speak for the experience of all women. I mean, I was one woman from one part of Canada and one generation. So the consultation that ministers engage in, in order to, to get input on what should be in their legislation and what should be in their policies is very important. And when I was justice minister, I remember first when I was doing consultation on some issues, it might've been on sexual assault, I can't remember. And some of the members of my department were a little bit annoyed that I wanted to meet with groups outside 
the usual groups that you met with, the Canadian Bar Association, you know, this group, that group, et cetera. And they came to see that, that when we met with these other groups, that we heard different things, that we got much more uh, real life ex uh, reflections on how the law played out in people's lives. And they came to understand that, and I would say to them, this is not because I don't think you're doing a good job, you're wonderful, but we don't have all the knowledge here. And even with these groups, we don't have all the knowledge. And I was interested that one of my successors as Minister of Justice was asked if she wanted to do the Campbell mode of consultation. Uh, in other words, something broader than the usual groups. And that's hard because, you know, when you're a minister, first of all, you're busy. And secondly, there are certain groups who are very active and are in there and wanting to talk to you. And using your imagination to figure out how you can hear the voices of other people is very important. And what I found, and I found this at all the levels, I've served at all three levels of elected government in Canada. And when I was in the provincial legislature, I traveled around the province to, to talk to people. And I always found that people are very articulate when they're talking about something they know. So you may go into a community and the people are terrified about speaking at a public meeting, but you ask them the right question and you will get very valuable information. So I think creating a culture of broadly based consultation that is seen as actually an important and admirable quality of how a minister conducts his or her uh, role and consultation in creating legislation is very important. But I was also struck with Professor Malik's uh, comments about uh, the federal and provincial cooperation. You know, in Canada, we are also a federal state. And federal provincial tensions can be very great. And different levels of government in Canada, local governments are created by the provincial legislature. So the cities and towns, the, the rules by which they operate are created at the provincial level. And so finding ways to create collaboration between the different levels of government is very important. You know, there's an old joke we used to tell that uh, three people are asked to write a book about the elephant, an American, a Frenchman, and a Canadian. And the Frenchman writes a book called Love and the Elephant. The American writes a book called Elephants for Fun and Profit. And the Canadian writes a book, The Elephant, a federal or provincial jurisdiction, which is just simply a joke about how this really gets into us. So I think Again, <clears throat> leadership at both the federal and provincial levels of reaching out and finding constructive ways of coordinating jurisdictions and making sure that levels of government are working well together and creating opportunities for local organizations and local governments to either be created if they're not there or to integrate them into the decision making. What, what resources do they have? Because sometimes they will say, well, You've given us the authority to do this, but we have no resources. So, I mean, unless we can have our own tax base or unless you give us money, we can't do these things. So a lot of it is just thinking rationally about how the different institutions that you have work together. Um, I don't think I don't think it's easy. And it's it's a challenge that all democracies face because everybody has their own territory that they want to, you know, they're they're part of the, the puzzle to be the best. Um, but I think those are those are some of the things that I would say about you know how to try and make the institutions you have work better, understanding that you're all sharing the same goal. And a lot of that comes also from just just from being respectful. You know, I always say that respect is the most valuable currency you will ever spend. And sometimes people at a national level, you know, think they're more important than the people at the provincial level, although the people at the provincial level may be making very important decisions. And the people at the local levels make really important decisions. I mean, they're the people who decide whether the potholes in your street get fixed or your garbage gets picked up. And often people's views about democracy are influenced by how their local governments work. So if you can be respectful of people at all levels, and, and see them as having a, a very important role to play in the big picture. Um, I think that helps to make your, your democratic institutions more functional. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, I think uh, you have rightly mentioned leadership matters a lot. And I would like to acknowledge that uh, this national adaptation plan was uh, led by uh, Senator Sherry Rahman, who uh, uh, Ms. Sherry Rahman, who have been very like uh, vibrant and uh, very active in terms of uh, uh, including uh, this inclusion uh,
perspective in the national adaptation plan. So when we have women in leadership role, when we have a person from various backgrounds in, in, the, in, in the leading roles, they play a lot of uh, their role. And you have also rightly talked about uh, the provincial, uh, federal provincial relationship and how the national plan can be implemented at the provincial level. Uh, for that perspective, we today we invited uh, 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 the provincial minister for minority affairs from Punjab, uh, Mr. Ramesh Singh Roda, and the uh, deputy speaker Navi, uh, Anthony Navitse from uh, Sindh. But uh, uh, unfortunately, they are right now they are in a meeting with a high level delegation visiting Pakistan, and uh, they are sitting in the meetings with limited access to internet. So they have sent their uh, greetings message to, uh, to you, Prime Minister Kim Campbell, and uh, to all the participants over here. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, we'll have uh, their uh, inputs and thoughts into this process as well. Uh, I'm also Mr. pleased Mr. to... Mr. Uh, Mr. If, if, if I can I just also add that two things, modern technology, as we're sitting talking to each other, and so I could see that Mr. Mirza laughed at my little joke about federal provincial relations. Thank you for uh, for your, your, your laugh at my little Canadian joke. Um, but... This, this technology does make it easier for us to see mm. one another and communicate. But we also have to make sure that it doesn't become a substitute for face-to-face -face meetings. I think going out and seeing people in their own turf, on their own in their own communities and what they're doing is an incredibly important part of what we learn from them. So it's lovely to be on Zoom and here am I sitting in Italy talking to you and we can connect and Maria Elena's in Madrid and you are all, you know, in Pakistan, that's great. And, and it should be, but but a lot of the people you need to speak to don't have access to Zoom. They don't have access to the internet. So we have to be careful. We don't get seduced by technology into the illusion that we're consulting when in fact, a lot of people who would have something important to teach us uh, are not part of the conversation. Uh, Thank you very uh, much. Excuse me, yeah. Ali, I would like, yeah, yeah, just a small uh, remark that if, if, a, if a Pakistani writes a book, you know, the book, the the, uh, he, the title would be uh, "Elephant and the Policeman." So <laughs> the, the the background to the <laughs> to this title is that it's a joke, Pakistani joke, that a policeman is driving uh, the elephant out of the jungle with a stick, and uh, the policeman is beating uh, the elephant, and the elephant is crying, "Yes, I have committed the crime. Yes, I have committed the crime." <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nisab. Uh, so this, uh, uh, you know, self self bashing. <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, thank you, uh, uh, oh, 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 I think it's so cruel. You know, I'm going to remember that. That's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. I do agree that uh, use of technology is very important in 21st century, but at the same time, these vulnerable communities and groups does not have access to those technology. And then they are left out uh, from uh, the benefit of uh, using the technology. Um, and I think that's where our uh, national partners uh, comes in uh, because our foundation, they have the extensive networks across uh, the country in 122 districts uh, within the four or five regions. They have uh, their offices there and networks over there. So having uh, like partners at the ground level, I think that's uh, one thing which is important. And that leads me to acknowledge also because uh, today's uh, uh, this policy discussion has been joined by a variety of uh, uh, stakeholders. And I would like to acknowledge that uh, we have been uh, joined by the uh, Senator uh, Sana Baloch uh, from Balochistan, who is again a very vocal voice uh, for the uh, voiceless, and uh, he has joined us. Uh, we have um, uh, Ms. Fraganda Aurangzeb from National Commission on hum from Human Rights, um, and also from um, National Commission from um, Human Development, Academia, Society, UN representatives and representatives from uh, different INGOs as well uh, participating to this dialogue. And uh, I am also thankful to some of the participants who have shared their thoughts and comments in the comment section. And I really appreciate and acknowledge that uh, uh, those comments as well. Uh, so uh, since uh, we started a bit late, uh, I, this uh, brings me to um, have uh, the thoughts of our uh, Secretary General, uh, uh, Maria Alina. You have uh, listened to these uh, discussions, uh, interesting discussions uh, by Prime Minister Kim well, Professor Dr. Rana, uh, Naim Mirza Saab, and uh, Senator Roshan Pushi Procha. Um, so, what are your uh, thoughts and what are your like, uh, what way forward uh, would you like to suggest? Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Ms. Maria Lena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you, Prime Minister Campbell. And thank you, all of you who've been participating in this. I think it's been a, a very, very rich discussion as the, our, ours are 
often are, usually are. And uh, in this case, focusing on, on the inclusive implementation of Pakistan's national adaptation plan on climate resilience, not just as, as a curiosity, but also as a as a process in learning, and and what are the the challenges that that you have been facing, and uh, and I think these have been highlighted, but also the 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 proposals and the solutions that that you are finding in uh, in the process, and in the process not only of having drafted the adaptation plan, but of its implementation, as has been highlighted. I wanted to raise one thing, if I may, uh, when Mr. Mista was was uh, speaking about. Uh, his uh, his views on on this uh, on this topic. One of the first things he mentioned uh, was the, the the challenge of finance, the the important challenge of budgets, having a budget to do the implementation. We all know that once plans are crafted and and drafted and approved, the the challenge becomes implementing those ideas and implementing those proposals. And budgets have a lot. Uh, to do with with that capacity to implement, and and uh, I wanted to to highlight in this sense that at Club de Madrid <clears throat> we are this year excuse me um, we are this year uh, focusing on the topic of financing for development, and because financing for development is is and financing is one of the the major hurdles let's say that uh, we have to face overcome and address when we we uh, approach implementation of any of our plans at the national regional or local level and uh, when we hear and we discuss all of the challenges that our societies are facing today and uh, the 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 desire to tackle these challenges and to be positive and constructive as as uh, as the minister was was pointing out and as all of us have uh, been stressing throughout this discussion uh, the resources available human but also financial are very important and in this sense and in the context of of, uh, of our work we will be focusing as club de madrid this year in our annual policy dialogue on the topic of financing for development climate finance is of course an, an essential element uh, in this picture and uh, there there is no fine climate finance if there's no financing for development and there is no development if there is no climate finance so these are all intimately related and and i i wanted to to point this out and and share with all of you so so that you can bring us also um more 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 ideas more experiences and and share them with us in terms of not only the need of, of uh, financing and, and resources for for development, but on how to address this, how we can um, further not only emphasize but work on the pivotal role of of partnerships domestically and internationally, and and of mobilizing resources in this process, uh, because this is something that, given the current uh, let's say geopolitical situation, is uh, is becoming more and more of a of, of a challenge to address, you know, that the mobilization of the resources necessary for development. And, and uh, also in terms of, of uh, some of the issues that were raised regarding youth uh, inclusion, uh, here again, point out that this is also the, that an issue that Club of Madrid is, is very much not only aware of, but that that is uh, addressing. We are, and uh, working in, in one of our projects on on youth and civic engagement and uh, democratic development and in this sense um all of these issues and in fact several of the of the young leaders that are part of the network that we have established in the context of this project of uh, women and youth and democratic development and civic engagement um there is a a pakistani member of this uh, of this network but uh, these are young individuals men and women who are already in decision-making positions, who are decision-makers, who are already uh, working in that implementation and in bringing to reality those those uh, those plans. And so um, please, uh, what, I would, what I would ask is that we continue our partnership, that we continue working on, uh, on these issues and to thank you uh, very sincerely for for your participation, your commitment, and your engagement in in these discussions, and bringing your own experiences and those of your 
uh, communities at the, the regional and local levels is, is very important so that we can share them with other uh, countries and, and, and with, with, with other, other communities in, with which we are working in our various projects. So uh, thank you again, and let's continue to try to mainstream this climate resilience into our policies, into our programs, into our projects as we move forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Maria Lina, for uh, highlighting some of the pertinent uh, issues. And again, climate finance is something which is very important. As and as I've mentioned in the earlier talk, that uh, only 0.03% of the Pakistani budgets goes to the climate uh, climate finance, which is. Uh, but at the same time, Pakistan is highlighting its case at the international forums and uh, loss and damage fund in, in, uh, in the COPs uh, every year. Like uh, these discussions take place over there and. Uh, Pakistan government is eager to make that kind of global and uh, national partnerships and uh, encouraging pri public-private partnerships to further support uh, the cause of climate change in Pakistan. Uh, so so uh, that uh, thoughts, in, and also thank you very much uh, for highlighting wide network as well, uh, which is empowering women and youth uh, in decision-making goals. Uh, so before uh, we go to the conclusion, I would, I would like to say that uh, uh, these kind of discussions, uh, it's uh, not a one-off discussion, but uh, we, uh, Club de Madrid and our partner or foundation remains on ground and uh, we keep on having interaction um, with the participants, with the community leaders over here. Uh, so it's an ongoing process and it's, it's a continuous. Uh, Name does have any final uh, words from your side, uh, like brief, any final brief comment and then I'll- Oh, this, thank you very much. You know, it was a very uh, good discussion. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, invite uh, the leadership of the Club de Madrid and uh, Your Excellency Kim Campbell to Pakistan, you know, uh, because uh, uh, when they were speaking, it was, uh, it looked to me that uh, they they were talking, you know, from uh, from our heart, you know, this, this is, this is a voice which actually this is a, a passion which we all cherish and which we all want to see that uh, the, the the this globe uh, is is saved uh, and you know uh, let uh, so so and I, I and you know being a feminist my uh, this is my uh, belief that the women will change, bring this change as they have uh, brought all, uh, you know, uh, changes and uh, from uh, from from the beginning of the civilization, from barbarism to civilization and from anything else to uh, everything else. So, uh, you know, uh, and this was a very, uh, you know, very good discussion. I really, uh, the last thing which I would like to say is that Oroch Foundation uh, has uh, made the climate justice its foremost priority. You know, we, we had this uh, gender-based violence and, uh, you, you know, and children uh, and vulnerable groups. And uh, climate justice is uh, at present our foremost uh, priorities. Uh, and uh, wherever we sit, we wherever we go, and since we, we are a national and, you know, outreach organization, uh, I think this is, uh, this is not a priority, but this is a, a kind of a uh you know uh, commitment that we must uh, do it thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, leading to leading the discussion to uh, a fruitful conclusion i hope to meet again and uh, thank you ali for uh, arranging all this thank you uh, the club de madrid uh, its officials and its team for uh, conducting and uh, making it uh, happen thank you very much uh, thank you, Naimi Zasab, uh, for your thoughts. And I would like to, in the end, I would like to request uh, Ms. Kim Campbell if you can uh, conclude today's discussion and then uh, we say okay. thanks uh, and bye to everyone. Yes. Well, just very briefly, I have enjoyed the presentations and there's a lot of wisdom. Uh, a lot of uh, your, your uh, panel members have been very, uh, very thoughtful uh, and have identified important things. I think of the importance that was mentioned of, of mindset and awareness, that it's one thing to have policies, but people have to have a mindset that that leads them to want to implement these things and that asks the right questions and is focused on the right, right priorities. Um, also, uh, the importance of inclusive lawmaking. So it's not just a matter of, of talking to people, but when we're making the, 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 the rules by which we will live and the policy 
policies by which we'll address problems right at the right at the ground level. So I think, um, and I'm and, and Mr. Mirza, thank you for your your uh, feminist declaration. But I think it's you, there was a strong uh, recognition of the the. The, the differential experience of many of these disasters by, by men and women, and physiologically, women are more susceptible to things like urinary tract infections when they're working in flooded water. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that, that require us to think constructively about the different ways that men and women uh, experience things, the gender disproportion. But I have to say that in my life, um, enlightened men have been a very important part of my ability to do things that I wanted to do. So, Mr. Mirza, thank you for your vote of confidence. But basically, at the end of the day, men and women have to come together and work together, bringing our own uh, experiences and our own realities. And uh, and if we respect one another and respect the fact that there are differences, not, I think, in capacity so much, but as in the reality of the lives that we live, That and if we understand how all of those plays out, in the things that we need to do to deal with with climate change, I think we'll have a much more successful successful result. So thank you very much. I've learned a great deal, and I've added another chapter to my my uh, joke about uh, about the elephant and what it tells us about national character. So thank you for that, and all the best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baba. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency Kim Campbell. And uh, with uh, that, uh, we come to the conclusion of uh, today's uh, policy discussion. I would like to thank uh, Her Excellency, uh, Ms. Kim Campbell, uh, Prime Minister of Canada, Ms. Uh, Maria Alina, uh, Secretary General, Mr. Neem Mirza, Executive Director AF, Professor Dr. Anna Malik, and most importantly, uh, many of uh, the participants who have been attending uh, this uh, session today. Um, a very prominent uh, like uh, Pakistani leadership uh, was attending today. So I, I'm, uh, I'd like to thank uh, each of you uh, individually and uh, also a member of uh, Wide Network also participated. So all these uh, uh, dignities, they were there. So I would like to thank and I, I, I would like to conclude it uh, by saying uh, uh, what uh, came from Ms. Kim Campbell today is uh, that uh, the human interaction um, has no comparison with this uh, digital uh, meetup. So as uh, Naim Zasaf has mentioned, we look forward to uh, Club New Madrid uh, members uh, visiting Pakistan uh, quite oftenly to lead uh, the contribute uh, in, in discourses over here. So with that point, I would like to thank our foundation team. I would like to thank Club New Madrid, uh, Madrid office team who have uh, worked for weeks uh, to make this a uh, success. So I'm thankful to everyone and uh, looking forward uh, to continue this uh, dialogue and discussion and thank you very much thank you ali for your fantastic collaboration always thank you very very much thank you ali. thank you very much as we say in italy ciao <laughs> ciao <laughs> ciao kim take care thank you bye 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 bye